week, right, on the introit, and that the introit is for us to help prepare our hearts and minds for today's worship service that uh, Rob Ramey is going to lead for us today. We're very glad that he's here. So please join me with our introit this morning. Another day is dawning, and prepare your hearts and minds for our worship service. <laughs> Respect for God and all that God offers to 
to us is the beginning of wisdom. With gratefulness we shall praise and honor God all our lives. Please join me in our, this morning's opening prayer. Lord of life and hope, we gather this day seeking nourishment for our souls and healing for our spirits. Give to us your living bread, that having been nourished in soul and spirit, we may be witnesses to your transforming love. Through the ministry and mission of Jesus Christ, the bread of life, we offer in this prayer. Amen. Please stand if you are able to join me in our opening hymn, Savior Like a Shepherd, Lead Us, hymn number 601. <laughs> turn our backs on God, God is ready to forgive and heal our spirit. God's love never fails, and we can rejoice in the power of that eternal love. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are healed and forgiven. Amen.
Please remain standing as we join together in the unison reading of our affirmation of faith, the Heidelberg Catechism, questions 1, 2, and 19. Friendship Presbyterian Church, what is it that we believe? What is your only comfort in life and death? But I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my Heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by His Holy Spirit, He also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for Him. What do you need to know in order to live and die in the joy of this comfort? First, how great my sins and wishes are. Second, how I am delivered from all my sins and misery. Third, how I am to be thankful to God for such deliverance. From where do you know this? From the Holy Gospel, which God himself first revealed in paradise. Later, he had it proclaimed by the patriarchs and prophets and foreshadowed by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law. Finally, he had it fulfilled through his only son. Please enjoy the special music, God's Been Good, by Legacy Father. There's no better way to tell you than to say God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. And though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could, cause through it all, God's been good. Times replay and I can see that I've cried some bitter tears. But I felt his arms around me as I faced my greatest fears. You see, I've had more gains than losses, and I've known more joy than hurt. As his grace rolled down upon me, undeserved, for God's been good in my life. I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. And though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could, cause through it all, God's been good. For God has been my Father, my Savior and my friend. His love was my beginning, and His love will be my end. I could spend forever trying to tell
tell you everything he is but the best way that i can say it is this God's been good in my life. I feel so blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. And though I've had my share of hard times, I wouldn't change them if I could, 'cause through it all. God's been good. I just love the Heidelberg Catechism, and I just wanted to make a couple of comments about the confession that we recited together a minute ago. You know that the worship of God on Sunday morning is for His flock, His sheep, and so we recite together that our comfort in life and death is through our faithful Savior Jesus Christ. If you can say that, you're His flock, you're His sheep. But you know the public worship of God is. Open to those that aren't his sheep, and if you happen to be here today and you can't say that about yourself, I'm delighted to welcome you, and I would love to talk to you about that afterwards. And if you don't, if you're not sure, you're his sheep. Because in the next question, we said, well, what do you need to know in order to live and die in this comfort? And you need to know three things we recited about your sin, about how the Lord delivers you from that sin. And about how thankful you are to Him for that deliverance. Well, if you don't know that, you need to talk to somebody so that you can. And then in the third question we recited, we said that we know this from the gospel, the good news of Scripture, which God Himself first revealed in paradise. Did you know that that God revealed the, the gospel in the Garden of Eden? Do we forget this? Think back to Genesis three. What did God say to the serpent? Of all things, he revealed the gospel in Scripture. First of all, to Satan, he said, "I will put enmity between your seed, your descendants, and the seed of the woman, Eve, our mother, who, through natural progression, gave birth through the human race to our Savior, Jesus Christ." And and God told the serpent, "You will bruise his heel." You will give him a wound, but he will bruise your head, and you will be forever defeated because he will make a way of salvation for his people. That's the gospel, all the way back there in the Garden of Eden. So remember this as we come to worship the living God on Sunday morning. It's for His people when we confess faithfully our our faith in Jesus Christ. Well, let's continue our worship this morning by taking of our tithes and offerings and praise Him in this. In this act,
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship you with our tithes and offerings. We thank you for the spirit of giving that you give us yourself through your Holy Spirit. We ask you would take these gifts and use them for your kingdom, grow them, multiply them, and give us a heart of thankfulness that we might continue giving throughout our lives. <clears throat> In Christ's name, amen. Please be seated. I looked at the um, prayer list. Uh, it's good, comprehensive, I assume. <laughs> um, I, I uh, commend that. Not all churches do that kind of thing, or they don't do it very consistently, so I'm grateful and thankful. And I hope you use this through the week as you're speaking to the Lord and uh, interacting with Him in your quiet times. If, uh, if you have something you want to add to that or highlight for that, uh, please feel free before I go to the Lord on behalf of the congregation. Anything anybody would like to share by way of a joy or concern? Sir? I have two joys. <clears throat> One, Desiree, my granddaughter, is coming home today from the hospital. Wow. Uh, the second, Bonnie Lorraine, is my great, great granddaughter. <laughs> Born last uh, Monday. Oh wow! <laughs> That's beautiful. You don't sound like you need much convincing. When the Lord talks in terms of the seed of the woman, the descendants of the woman, you understand how significant that is to have faithful descendants. I think. Thank you for mentioning those. Any anyone else? Well, I mean. It's a joy because uh, Izzy got hit by her first deer. Oh. All, all it did was hurt the car. It didn't hurt her at all. She was fine. She didn't panic or anything. She got hit by what? Got, got hit by what? Deer. I didn't hear that. A deer? A deer. A deer. Oh, wow. Yeah, I said the deer. But she's fine. Everything's fine. So that. God for his sustaining grace, right? What else? We had what was celebrating 59 years of marriage this week. 59? Oh, wow. Okay, we'll be impressed next year. <laughs> Back in 60 and, you know, that's incredible. And in our culture, yeah. especially where it's so easy to walk away from vows. Uh, that's a, quite an honorable achievement, really, and, and uh, uh, an encouragement for the rest of us. Congratulations. Karen and I celebrated our 61st. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're keeping up, yeah, I was going to say, we're, we're now keeping up with the Joneses. <laughs> Beautiful. Ma'am. My husband and I have been married 43. 43. <laughs> of Jesus Christ and his body, the church. He calls her the bride of Christ. He talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb at his return one day. That's a beautiful image, and when our marriages reflect that, it honors him. Think in cosmic terms when you reflect on your vow-keeping to each other. Beautiful. Anything else, Matt? Yes. School is starting up here. I understand Michael is starting on Wednesday going to school, and uh, and then other schools are starting at different times. So I you know, ask your prayers for all these kids going off to school and for their teachers. And Lily's starting school too. And what? Who? Lily. Lily. Not, not till no. next Monday. Michael's going to go back on Wednesday, so he'll start go back Wednesday, and then Darcy goes back next Monday. And I'm not. 
not sure when it's supposed to be on Monday. Monday. Everyone, they're all starting. <laughs> on Saturday. I'm a retired teacher. I miss going back to school, but that's yeah. all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Well, and if you could pray for me, I, I start my third year of seminary in two weeks, so I've got, I've got my own little third year going. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, truth be told, I love it. I could be a student the rest of my life. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really more for me. But I, 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 um, I, uh, I hear what you're saying. School is a commitment, and it, it can be intimidating. <clears throat> what else? Anything else this morning? I have a few, I have a few friends that need prayers. Yeah. And Too much of a good thing isn't always good, is it? <laughs> we want rain, but we don't want too much rain. Wind. What else? Anything else this morning? <clears throat> well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank Him, praise Him, invoke His presence, and we will um, uh, close by a unison uh, recitation of the Lord's Prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, dear Son, dear Holy Spirit, we are so grateful for your presence with us this morning. We ask for your grace to be faithful in all we say and do and believe that our very beliefs and what we think are expressions of our faithfulness to you and we can, we can stray even in these things. <clears throat> Help us to remain dependent on you for everything we enjoy in our lives and never to forget that even our successes, our comfort, our peace is a, uh, a gift of your gracious hand. <clears throat> when we have things that call to our mind, our dependence, things that we ask you for your special care regarding these things, uh, we remember specifically this morning all the things on our prayer list and even above and beyond some that have been voiced especially this morning. We thank you for these um, faithful marriages that are modeling for the rest of us your covenant love for your people. We thank you that we can submit to spouses and others. We thank you that when marriages survive this long, it's because we have learned how to be humble and to compromise on things and to regard others as more important than ourselves. <clears throat> we thank you, dear Lord, for the um, protection that you've given to one that was uh, in a car accident, uh, others that are suffering from various physical ailments. Remind us that our very lives, the heartbeats that we enjoy moment to moment, the breaths that we take, fresh air, clean water, all of these are gifts of your gracious hand that sustain our lives. <clears throat> we pray for comfort for our, our family, friends who've lost a loved one. We ask your grace, help them to come to a greater dependence on you and knowledge of you as a result of the loss, to ask ultimate questions and to find ultimate answers in the Bible and in your son, Jesus Christ. For our friend who's suffering from dementia, ask your blessing that you would cut through confusion and 
disorientation and delusion and would bring your peace that passes all understanding. <clears throat> we thank you for our worship this morning and that we live in a country where we can do this without fear of retaliation. We thank you for our civil magistrates. We ask your blessing for them. We ask that you convict them of their sin. We ask that you would guard their hearts to make decisions consistent with your order in the universe. And we ask that you would give us the grace to support and pray for them, however strongly we may disagree from time to time. And now, dear Lord, we thank you that you gave us words with which to pray to you faithfully. And we recite those together in the manner that our Lord taught us, saying, Dear Lord, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Please stand now for our hymn of preparation, The Lord's My Shepherd. realize I forgot to ask the Lord's blessing on our students um, and particularly our athletes and it reminded me that I had emailed Sue a couple of hymn options this week and she audible she, she found some other hymns that were as appropriate and actually in the hymnal so um, <laughs> rem I remind that to your I recall that to your um, prayer list this week, the students. Well, before we open God's word this morning, let me open with a uh, prayer of <coughs> illumination and ask the Holy Spirit's special grace for us as we read words together from his word. 
Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Blessed are you, Lord, our gracious Father, whose love is revealed in your Son, whose love is the delight of all life, and whose word we love as the light of life. Pour out your Spirit as we read from your prophets and apostles, that in meditating on them our hearts might be illumined and our days filled with peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We'll have the text of Scripture on the screen in front of you. I do invite you, if you have your Bible or a Bible nearby, to grab that. I'll um, maybe make reference to a couple of verses around that this morning to help put this text of Scripture in context. If you have that Bible, turn with your Turn with me to Mark chapter 6. We'll read in a second, starting at verse 30. 30. Uh, Mark includes this episode. This is the account of Jesus feeding 5,000 men. We know it's 5,000 men because each of the four Gospels includes this miracle. It's the only miracle other than the resurrection of our Lord that is contained in all four Gospels. So that um, maybe suggests some special importance for this account. And what we learn from Matthew's account, we won't read in this text, but in Matthew we learn that it was 5,000 men and an additional company of women and children. So we could be talking about as many as 10, 15, possibly 20,000 people uh, on the hillside that day. And really the point of this story We'll see in the context of the prior account in Mark 6, what we won't read, but comes just before this, is that what Jesus does is expresses compassion on a crowd of hungry people as a way of defining and explaining and revealing to their eyes who he really is, what his real identity is. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. you will have the New International Version on the screen. Uh, listen for some differences and nuance that you might get from each translation. They're both equally good, equally faithful. Um, but this illustrates a little bit that sometimes in Bible translation, it's not always an exact science. And people looking at the exact same Greek words might slightly differ in how best to carry those forward into English. So I'll begin reading at verse 30 through verse 44. This is God's word for you. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii eat? Or eight months' wages, as the NIV says, worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. And they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing, and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples and set before the people, to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And when they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish, 
And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Here ends the reading of God's word. Now the background is important to this 15 <coughs> story about the feeding of 5,000 men. Why is it important? Because what we learn in the beginning of Mark chapter 6, the very first couple of verses, is the account of Jesus being rejected by his own hometown in Nazareth. And then, in the next six or seven verses, he sends out his 12 disciples, the apostles, proclaiming the gospel and performing miracles and demanding repentance of all his hearers in and around the countryside in Galilee. Then we come to a, a very sobering account in John Mark 6 of Herod's execution of John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist was in prison because Herod got sick and tired of hearing him preach the, his need for repentance and the convicting words about how he had taken another man's wife as his own wife and was living in sin as a result of it. And what did Herod do? Herod unfaithfully, sinfully, criminally ordered the execution of John the Baptist. And then we come into the feeding of the 5,000. And it raises the immediate question, why would Mark have ordered the story this way. You know, the gospel writers had choices to make. They had limited resources. Um, what we would think of as a throwaway commodity in our culture, in our wealthy Western society, pen and paper, uh, was not. It, it, was a, it was a rarity in the first century. And when a, when a gospel writer had to commit a story to pen and paper, or parchment, or papyrus, or whatever they were using at the time, it required some forethought. What do I have the resources to include? And so we can infer that John, or, or that Mark in this case, was very specifically making a choice. He goes from the commission of the 12 apostles and, and Jesus' rejection by his hometown into this story of an unfaithful leader of Israel, Herod. This was Herod Antipas, by the way. If you know your history at all. Not Herod the Great, who was ruling all of Israel at the time of Jesus' birth. But one of his sons, Herod Antipas, in the north, became the ruler of Galilee. And for most of Jesus' life, Herod Antipas was the ruler, the civil magistrate, over Galilee, including Nazareth, including Bethsaida, where this, near where this miracle took place, and all of the northern region in and around the Sea of Galilee. You can note that probably in one of the maps in the back of your Bible. You can see where is the region of Galilee where our Lord grew up in his physical lifetime. So what we've done, what Mark has done, is display a shepherd. Yes, a shepherd. Herod Antipas is responsible for God's people, but he's an unfaithful shepherd. He's an evil shepherd. And it's almost as though the Old Testament record of shepherding had Herod Antipas in mind. Before I we turn to our four points for this passage, I, I must recall to your memory an Old Testament text that specifically talks about unfaithful shepherds of Israel. And I'm referring to Ezekiel chapter 34. Listen to a couple of verses where hundreds of years earlier, Ezekiel, as a mouthpiece of the Lord himself, is prophesying the evil that will befall unfaithful shepherds. And the people, by extension, will suffer as a result of their unfaithfulness. He says in verse 2, Ezekiel 34, Son of man, prophesy, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, Ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? 
in the account of Herod Antipas, connected with his criminal execution of John the Baptist, we learn he was giving a banquet for his nobles and his wealthy patrons. He was feeding himself and he was displaying for Israel exactly what Ezekiel had prophesied hundreds of years earlier. Verse 5, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. Verse 8, as I live, declares the Lord, God, surely because my sheep have become a prey and my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts. Since there was no shepherd and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep. Can you hear echoes in that of our passage this morning? What was Jesus doing on that mountainside in Galilee? He was feeding his sheep. He was feeding them. He was displaying for Israel how a good shepherd behaves, not how an unfaithful, ugly shepherd like Herod Antipas was behaving. And we have all too many examples of this in Scripture, don't we? Unfaithful shepherds. So with that background in mind, we can come to a couple of points in our text this morning. We'll look at them under the uh, four, four headings I have on the screen here. In the first one, we begin with verse 30, and it's really important to see the connection all the way back to verse 13. So back in verse 13, just before the Herod Antipas, John the Baptist episode, Jesus had sent his disciples out into the countryside to preach the gospel. And Mark records, and they cast out many demons, verse 13, and appointed with oil, anointed with oil, many who were sick, and, and they healed them. And then the episode of Herod Antipas. And then Mark comes back in verse 30, our text for this morning. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. So after all that evangelizing and conviction of sin they were proclaiming in Galilee, they come back to Jesus and they tell him what they had done. You can just imagine the scene, the 12 apostles. By the way, Mark calls them apostles in the ESV. The apostles returned. This is the only case in, in the whole Gospel of Mark where he refers to the 12 inner, inner circle as the Lord's apostles, his sent ones. They returned to Jesus and told them all he had, they had said and done. Why? Did Jesus not already know what they had done and said? He sent them. He knew what they were doing. In his divine nature, he knew everything. But it was important for him to listen to them. And for them to share their burdens with him and their joys and their excitement. I can just imagine Peter saying something to the Lord. I met a woman who said this. I can just imagine John saying to the Lord. I met a woman who said this um, and did that. Or Philip or Nathaniel or any of the others. What were they telling Jesus? Could be anything. What's the lesson for us? Do you tell Jesus what you're experiencing? Why not? He knows it already, and we, we ask him for things that he already knows we need before we ask. But the point is that we express our dependence on him, and we share our excitement with him. That brings him joy. Just like the apostles did. Let's learn from there. There are examples on that. And notice his, his response. He can see that they have been basically exhausting themselves in fulfilling his charge to go out and share the gospel in the countryside, and they were tired, and they were hungry. And the Lord says, let's go away to a private place where you can rest and spend some time together with me privately. And they, of course, the disciples were overjoyed at that prospect. And so you can almost imagine from the narrative, Mark doesn't actually say it, but when they see this big crowd running along the shoreline, you know, they're in a ship, and they're going to a, a desolate place. The ESV says three different times, a desolate place. You know, there's echoes in this passage all over the Old Testament. I mentioned 
I mentioned Ezekiel 34. There's, there's so many other episodes of shepherds and sheep and unfaithful shepherds, even in the Old Testament. Another one of these echoes is that reference to a desolate place. You know, in the Old Testament, a wilderness, a desolate place, is almost always where a prophet went to meet with God. So the disciples going with Jesus, God, of course, incarnate, to a desolate place would remind us who, with eyes of faith, apply the whole counsel of God to our understanding and our reading of any individual text and say, ah, yes, the disciples are going to meet with God, even as they're going with Jesus to rest in a desolate place. Mark doesn't actually tell us where this desolate place was, but Luke adds it was Bethsaida, which isn't very far. But they're in a ship going on the Sea of Galilee from one place to the other. <laughs> and you can, you can you sort of follow the dialogue, follow the narrative. You're seeing this crowd and all these people streaming out from homes and villages, seeing Jesus in the ship out on the, on the Sea of Galilee, heading to another point. And they're trying to race over and beat them to the spot where they anticipate they will hit landfall. And they do, and you can imagine the disciples going, oh, there goes our rest. There goes the desolate place we thought we were going to have Jesus to ourselves. But is that how Jesus responds? If that, if that was the disciples' reaction, and it, truth be told, it probably would have been my reaction, I would have wanted that time alone. We come to our second point, a shepherd's compassion for a shepherdless flock. So I don't think Jesus was taking that opinion at all of the situation where the disciples were exhausted and wanted time alone with Jesus just to eat and to rest and to talk about their experiences, sharing the gospel. Wonderful things. Jesus is, it's almost as if he would say, there's going to be time for that later now. We have another task in front of us. And he stops what he's doing with the disciples. And as they hit the land, what's he do? He went ashore, verse 34. And I think verse 34 is almost the key verse in this whole episode. Because it gives us the heart of Jesus, the motivation. What's it say? Mark says so beautifully, he had compassion on them. Of course, in his divine nature, he knew the soul of every one of them. But there were 5,000 men and another company of women and children. There was a ton of people on that shore. And Mark simply says in verse 34, he had compassion on them. Why? Why did Jesus have compassion on them? Only Mark adds, because they were like sheep without a shepherd evoking all of that rich, glorious Old Testament imagery of the unfaithful shepherds of Israel, like Herod Antipas, who all these Jews would have known very well, all these 10, 15,000 men, women, and children. Everybody knows Herod Antipas. Like in modern, the modern equivalent, everybody knows Joe Biden. Everybody knows Donald Trump. Everybody then knew Herod Antipas. They knew that this was an unfaithful shepherd of Israel. And it was important that Jesus display what a faithful shepherd looks like. So in his compassion for them, recognizing they didn't have a faithful shepherd, he begins to show them in tangible ways what a faithful shepherd says and does. And notice at the very end of verse 34, this is so instructive. The first thing he did was not food. I mean, material food. The first thing he did was he began to teach them. And he began to teach them many things. In one sense, I would have given anything to know what those things were. What were those many things Jesus was telling these 15,000 people? But in another sense, I'm pretty confident I already know what he was teaching them. 
Because in the four Gospels, we have oceans of material that God's Holy Spirit has given him by his sovereign appointment. We know God's thoughts, and we know what Jesus taught. We have the Sermon on the Mount. We have the final discourse with his apostles that he would deliver these same twelve a couple of years later in the upper room toward the end of John. We have many of Jesus' teachings, thank God. So we have already a pretty good idea of what he would have said to that crowd. He would have preached a gospel of repentance. He would have told them to be baptized. He would have given them teaching about the kingdom of God, what it is like, what the very character of God his Father is like. And so before he ever gets to their physical hunger, he satisfies their spiritual hunger. He gives them the very teaching of God himself, which the Old Testament prophets at various points referred to as food. What did Jesus say to Satan when he was tempted in the wilderness? At the very beginning of his public ministry, Satan said, well, just bow down to me and I'll, yeah, I know you're hungry, Jesus, you've been fasting for 40 days. I'll turn these stones into bread you can eat. And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He was quoting Deuteronomy 8 when Jesus said that. Well, I think I'll probably have that in mind here as he's about to feed upwards of 15,000 people a miraculous feeding from five loaves and two fish. He's immediately concerned with a greater kind of feeding. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God will feed these 15,000 plus people first, and then we'll get to their physical hunger pains. But you know, they went together. So Jesus was describing, he was first satisfying their ultimate hunger and giving them words of faith and nourishment for them to feed and chew on and digest. And then it comes to their physical hunger. And that achieves a, a, a variety of things. But let me hold that thought though first. Our third point is important because we get to Jesus' correction of his disciples, right? So they're all, we, we, we go from disappointment that all these God's people are robbing them of their private time with Jesus Christ and their food and their rest at a desolate place to them saying, you know, Lord Jesus, send these people away, verse 36. You know, let them, let them go find their own food. It's almost like they're saying, good luck with that. You know, go, <laughs> yeah, you're probably hungry and, uh, you know, go be fed, be well, but they're not going to care for them directly. And what does Jesus say? The good shepherd seeing hungry, a hungry flock provides some teaching for his own under-shepherds. You know, the disciples are under-shepherds. He told them to shepherd the flock. And he says, no, my first lesson for you is that you don't run from your flock when they're hungry. You take care of them. You, you become a good shepherd yourself, and you nourish them. So he said, no, give, you give them something to eat, verse 37. And they push back again. Really, this many people, it would cost a fortune. You, you, you want us to feed them, or you want us to go out into the countryside and buy enough food for them? They're not even realizing what he's saying. He's saying, through me, you can feed them. Give them me. Give them me. And so he produces basically one of the most beloved miracles in the entire Bible, giving all these people, food to eat out of five loaves and two fish. You know, I get a kick sometimes. I read commentaries on what biblical scholars say about various passages of Scripture. It's almost comical. There are liberal theologian Bible scholars who just want to scrub, they're so, so anxious to scrub the miraculous out of this account. Oh, this was a, a Eucharistic service, and so each of these people got nothing but a tiny morsel of bread, a tiny morsel of bread. <laughs> or they'll say, Jesus simply um, 
convinced them to share with each other food that they had already brought. I mean, these are ridiculous accounts. These are ridiculous explanations. If you just read the passage itself, <laughs> the whole point of this was for Jesus to declare his messianic character by, by performing a miracle. Wasn't it? What, what wasn't a morsel each? They ate and were satisfied, the text says. In fact, John even says they each ate until they were filled. It was a miracle. And the idea that they were sharing with each other food that they had already brought. Well, if that's the case, why were the disciples concerned where they were going to get enough food for everybody? They knew that people didn't have food and weren't bringing food to share. They needed either a miracle or eight months' worth of salary to buy enough food for all these people. No, this was a miracle. And this was a case where the God of the universe, who in the, in the very beginning produced something out of nothing, here again produced something out of nothing. You know, the fact that these were very common loaves and fish is instructive. <clears throat> What, what, are we, what, what are we to take from the fact, it does, Mark doesn't say it, but one of the other accounts said they were barley loaves, not wheat loaves. In the ancient Near East, barley was the more common but cheaper of the grains. And so Jesus took a very common thing and he provided enough nourishment for this many people. He's displaying for them and for the world. What he would later say, I am the bread of life. If you feed on the Lord Jesus, you will be satisfied, not just in what your immediate hunger that will return needs, but your ultimate needs, the needs that will satisfy you for all eternity. Let me just make one final uh, comment on this from the, the last point. The, the good shepherd here, he commands his disciples to make everyone sit down. Mark says in verse 39, he commanded them to sit down on the green grass. Does that sound familiar? He, he caused them to sit down on the green grass. One of the Psalms says, he makes me lie down on green pastures, right? Psalm 23, verse 2. The great good shepherd's song, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Do you think it's any coincidence that Mark is using language that makes us immediately think of the good shepherd imagery from Psalm 23? No, it's beautiful. Yet again, Jesus is displaying, even in the way Mark describes this, that he is our good shepherd who will satisfy our hunger for all eternity. Well, <clears throat> There's a couple of ways I, I'll, I'll leave you with that these verses ought to change us and that we ought to remember about this account. One of these is that Jesus Christ is worth following not just for the miracles, but for who he is, that he will satisfy us by his very person for all eternity. I don't know why this crowd was following him on that shore, seeing him triangulating where he was going to land on the shore and trying to get to that spot. There could be any number of motivations. But the true motivation is that you eat of him and are satisfied because of the life-giving bread of himself that he provides us. Second thing is that the feeding he said he provides isn't exotic or extravagant. It doesn't have to be sensational. It's just the simple, nourishing food of his word and his person coming to us every day as we feed on his scriptures and commune with him individually. And then just always remember that Jesus is for us and his compassion for you if you are his sheep. If you're wondering if Jesus is a reliable, trustworthy shepherd, just look at how he treats people. Those that come to him humbly, submissively, they get what they need most. They may not get what they think they need. They may not get what they say they want, 
infected by this culture's endless, relentless pursuit of compromising your ultimate desires, that if we're honest with ourselves, what we need is forgiveness of sin and rec reconciliation with God our Father. And only Jesus Christ can provide that. That is our ultimate food and our ultimate satisfaction. Well, let's close in prayer and thank you for these wonderful truths. And I invite you to think on these things further later today as you go back and review these glorious words of hope and prayer. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the bottom of our hearts that you are our good shepherd, that you give us what we truly need, that you feed the hunger that we don't even know we have sometimes, that which we ultimately truly need, our real needs, not just our felt needs or the needs that society tells us ought to be satisfied. We thank you for preserving for us this account in inerrant scripture so that we can feed on it generation after generation until your return and we get to see you face to face what we do now by faith. And we ask you this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, please rise for our closing hymn, after which we will have our benediction. Now hear this good word of benediction from the Lord himself. And now may God, of, the God of peace, who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with ever, everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.